it wasn't too long ago that uh, I was part of this group. You know, I graduated from IIT about seven years ago, uh, maybe 30 pounds lighter and uh, a, a bit bit wiser, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so I did not realize it back then, but when I look back, I realized how incredibly lucky I was to get the education that I had uh, at IIT. And uh, like many of you, how incredibly lucky you are to be exposed to events like TEDx and uh, and whatnot, right? And if you think more about it, you know, uh, in like Dr. Jakarbati talked about how we are in a day and age where we can send a mission to Mars, right? Uh, you can go to the remote village in India, you will see ITC cigarettes, right? Uh, you'll probably even see Pepsi and Coke in some of the most remote villages. And personally, I feel it's atrocious that in this day and age, we don't have access to good education when all these other things are happening. And that's the problem we want to solve. Um, we are really a very small startup. It's called Coursera. Uh, we are both, like uh, Anirudh mentioned, we are based out of Mountain View, uh, not too far away from the Google's campus. And over the next few minutes, we'll try to peel this onion and then try to understand why is this a very hard problem to solve and how, uh, in Indian context, uh, we could actually try to solve it. So Professor Chandra, who is the director at IMB, uh, made this statement last year. You know, change at the scale we will see in the next 10 years in education in India is unprecedented in human history. Right. On the face of it, it seems a bit like an exaggeration. Wait, in human history, over the next 10 years in India, the change is unprecedented. Right. Um, but if you think more about it, and this is something that we'll kind of dwell a little bit deeper into, we'll start to understand that there's a lot of truth to this statement. And uh, first, let's set the context for that. Uh, so we'll just try to understand the demographics of what makes India unique uh, when it comes to solving education. What are the challenges that we face today? And could online, online education be a potential solution? This is one thing that we have tried so far. And what have we learned so far? And uh, we'll wrap it up. Yeah. So quick look at the demographics. Uh, 1.3 billion people, one of them. Uh, literacy rate, 63%, hovering around there, gradually creeping up. Uh, a more interesting stat is how would India look in 2025, right? 600 million people under age 25. That is by far the most any country would have in the whole world. We have 50 million uh, middle class today. It's going to be 500 million middle class uh, in, in our economy in about just about nine years. And, uh, and Dr. Chakravarti alluded to this a bit earlier. 40% of the talent pool in the world is going to come from India and China. Just think about that number. That Two out of every five people that you're going to meet in your day-to-day -day work is either going to be from India or China. Right. Now let's think about, let's look at like some of the things that are happening today in India. We have about 354 million internet users, and we are onboarding close to about 70 million every year, and that's more than the population of the U.S. as it stands today. And um, an interesting fact to note here is that India is the world's number one in terms of actually doing e-commerce on internet as a percentage of internet population. Right. The second biggest change that underpins uh, the current in like, you know, that, that underpins the changes in education is the rapid adapt adaptation of mobile. Right. 90% of Indians are expected to have 3G coverage by next year. And if you look at the number of millions of uh, internet users who are accessing, uh, mobile users who are accessing internet through phones exclusively, that's also a staggering number. And these have profound changes and the way we look at education and how education is going to be done. OK, so where are we with the higher education today? Right. So currently, we have about 30 million uh, students who are enrolled in colleges, uh, about 45,000 institutions, uh, close to 659 universities. The number one we want to focus on is the 659 universities and the gross enrollment ratio. What this really tells you is that of the 150 million students who are in India today, who can enroll in a university? Only 30 million students are actually enrolling in a university. And this is a problem. And we need to understand why is it the case uh, that we are in this situation today. Right. Uh, this shouldn't come as, shouldn't come as a surprise to this group. Uh, almost 42% of the people are enrolled in one of business tech or data courses. Uh, primarily, some level of engineering to product management sort of courses. That's about uh, 12 million people. So let's say a population of 1.2, 1.3 billion, working f uh, close to 480 million, of which the organized labor is 29 million. 
So what we're really trying to summarize here is that of all the education that we have done in the last 50 years, only 30 million people in total are recognized as organized labor. Uh, by that, meaning people who are considered uh, to be counted as employed in a sector, in a skill, that they have had their education and uh, considered organized, right? And uh, not a surprise is that the biggest employer is again the IT sector in India. Right. So where did we miss the boat? Like you know, 1.3 billion population, but only 30 million people in total who are actually considered part of an organized sector. Right. Let's see. The first gap is the supply demand gap. So what do we actually mean by that? Right. Again, uh, this do doesn't probably apply to many of you who are in top institutions, right? Who probably have access to good faculty. But the norm for majority of the institutions in India is that 30 to 40 percent of the faculty positions are unfulfilled, right? The high student to teacher ratio, like close to 80 to 1 ratio in some of the schools. This is a problem too. There's not that much uh, effect to quality assurance and complete lack of accountability by most of the institutions, right? You know, that what we mean by that is when a student joins the college, he's told that, hey, you can get an engineering degree, you can get uh, XYZ, you will have a bright future. Uh, but if for whatever reason uh, that doesn't happen, obviously there's an accountability on the part of the student. But is, there is also needs to be accountability on the part of the institution in the way they promote this, right? Now, all of these problems are going to be exact, like, becomes extremely bigger as we look for the next nine years. But, uh, uh, when the middle class moves from 50 to 500 million and more and more people are able to pay for the education that they want. The second gap is the, the enrollment that we talked about before. Right? We only enroll about 18% of the eligible people who we can enroll. Right? That's by far the lowest number in most of the countries, in the BRIC countries. It's 26% in uh, China and 36% in Brazil. And the government has set a target by 2020, they would want to move from this 18% accounts to 30 mil 26 million actual students, they want to move it to 40 million. That's an increase of almost 14 million in four years, right? Um, now 2016. So that would mean we need another 800 universities and over 40,000 new colleges to actually account for this 14 million gap that we are talking about to hit our target of 30% enrollment. Um, that's a pretty aggressive goal, right? The skills gap, right? Um, this number probably shocks a lot of people when you hear it the first time. And McKinsey did a very detailed audit on this: is what is the actual percentage of people who graduate from engineering colleges in India that are considered employable? Um, and uh, for somebody who went through an IIT placement system, you might be like, "Wait, that doesn't make sense." You know, of course, 100% are employable, but the reality is that for most colleges out there, 10% like. In Tamil Nadu, only 10% of the engineering, 300,000 engineering graduates are actually considered employable. And the numbers are not that different from every, from every other state. Um, what is even more interesting is that the education providers think that they're actually producing uh, students who are considered employable, but the perception among the, among the students and the employers is actually significantly different. They don't really feel that they're ready for a, a job yet. And finally, the cost gap, right? 69% um, of India is uh, still uh, living on less than $2 a day, right? So we are really talking about a bunch of issues here. One is availability of education, which is, I'm, I'm from Andhra. In Andhra, there are, uh, there are schools where from age six, they train you for IIT and Bits Pilani, and parents are standing in line to actually get the students admitted into that, right? So how many people can actually do that, like you know, train their kids from age six to get into a premier institute. Um, the second thing is accessibility. Let's assume that you somehow got your kid into there. With less than $2 a day, which is 70% of the population, uh, can you really afford the education rates? And uh, if you look at the last 50 years, accounting for inflation, the, co the college fees has increased 700%. But the $2 has not increased that much. Uh, and third, let's say you do get the availability, you are able to pay for it, but by the time you graduate, you really don't have the opportunity to utilize education that you spent four years of your life and actually get a job that you want. And um, this, is, this is a big problem for us, especially um, as we are becoming the world's second biggest economy and mo most of the other countries in the world will look to India for guidance. So 
Um, I really love this quote by Thomas Friedman, who's uh, a very famous economist. Uh, he talks about how the biggest breakthroughs in history happened when there is a desperate need and somebody needs to come with a solution, right? Now, um, I, I don't claim to have all the answers. Uh, I would highly doubt if anybody can make that claim. Uh, but let's see what we have tried so far. You know, A quick history of Coursera. Uh, it started in 2012 uh, just as a simple machine learning class coming out of Stanford by two professors. Um, they were really surprised that within a couple of weeks, 100,000 students have enrolled online. And fast forward three years, uh, we are close to about 17 million learners from 190 countries, um, 140 university partners, pretty much every major university in the world is a partner of Coursera, close to 1,300 courses. Yeah, and to summarize all that, what this is, is really trying to say is that we are seeing that there, has been a there is a huge demand, there is a huge need, and the world is re really ready for a solution that can bring these two together and then actually give, produce value to the students. Um, we did our first kickoff with ISB uh, last year in India, so we're just trying to, we are just at the tip of the iceberg when it comes to understanding India and online education. Um, so I, I want to spend a minute just talking about, hey, why is uh, an online course different than an on offline course, right? Uh, for some of you who are involved in NPTEL, this might be fairly obvious. NPTEL is an initiative from IIT Madras uh, that started not too long ago. Um, so the biggest change uh, that you see in an uh, online course is this. Let's say if you're in a classroom, you know, I remember Physics 101, uh, the professor is going to ask a question, it's like, okay, can somebody answer this equation, right? Chances are 20% in the class are zoned out, right? They're on Facebook or whatever it is, right? Um, about 30 to 40% of the class is still trying to understand and parse this question as to what exactly is being asked. And another 20% probably already raised their hand probably in the front seat and then ready with the answer. And other 20 persons are somewhere in between. So within five minutes, the professor moves on. So 80% of the class still did not understand what just happened, right? But the same scenario translated into an online course would be, you could probably pause, you know, you could probably say, hey, I didn't quite understand this concept. And the next concept is actually built on top of this one. So let me spend some time try to, try to understand this, right? The second biggest uh, value that comes out of an online course is, you know, usually a lot of times you learn, like, you know, if you go to Gurunath right before Ensem, you'll see a lot of people taking Xerox copies of, like, your notebooks, right? When people talk to each other in the dorm, they're like, I didn't quite get this, you know, can you help me understand this? Uh, like, being able to capture the discussions in a format where others can actually read is extremely valuable and can be done online. So what have you seen in India? So India, more than any other country, differs significantly in the courses that are actually done in, in the country. Right? Uh, if, you look at, like, if you look at, take a US population and then say, hey, what are the top 10 courses in the US? There are probably courses like child nutrition, learning how to learn, modern psychology. Uh, the courses of the nature where, you know, this is targeted at people who are learning lifelong or they probably wanted to learn something during their college and they missed out of that, on that opportunity. Whereas in India, almost all the top courses are directly career-related courses, directly addressing a need where people feel like, I need to learn this to help me get a job or to help me advance in my career, right? Uh, let's see. Uh, and India, in, within two years, India actually become our top, uh, it's second biggest in terms of daily active users that come and access these courses, and it's third biggest in terms of the, of the total users. The second thing that we've seen, uh, which is again very unique to India, is almost 50% of the users who come from India actually have a college degree. And um, this number is so much bigger than every other country, which usually ranges about 10 to 15%. Uh, so what this, what this really tells you is that, so people have actually gone to college, they finished, they got a degree, but they fell short somewhere, and they're trying to actually go out, outside or online or wherever it is, and try to access some material that they feel is needed for them. This particular interest of to my team, which is the growth team, is the primary access in India is through mobile. Uh, if you think about it, this presents a unique set of challenges. How do you deliver high quality video at a very low bandwidth on mobile, where users are probably more concerned about uh, their battery, hey, the screen size, and things like that. And especially with the new regulation that you cannot really have the videos inside the country, they need to be hosted outside the country or somewhere else, right? Um, so this actually, is a much harder problem to solve than you would imagine otherwise. The third thing is career advancement is by far the most important reason. 
to take. Like, you know, if you ask people, why do you want to take an online course in India? 70% of the time it's that I need to get ahead in my career, right? Um, so this is a common problem that most startups face, um, or most companies in India face today, is the ability for the current infrastructure to actually uh, be able to handle some of these mobile things that we talked about, or be able to handle high bandwidth video, um, and actually deliver it at scale, right? It's easy to deliver it for 100,000 people, uh, but it's much harder to deliver it for half a billion people. And this is the problem that we are actually trying to just uh, understand and solve. Um, this is my favorite, you know? uh, so, so we ran a survey to find out, hey, if you were to take a course from Stanford or IIT, uh, which one would you prefer? Actually, 75% of the time, people would rather prefer a course from IIT than a course from Stanford, and I really loved it. And similar numbers from IM versus Wharton. Um, again, this probably is not that surprising at some level, I guess. You know, maybe there is a tendency to say, I would rather have the instruction done in a local format. Uh, but it's really heartening to see that you know people really want to encourage local university participation and take courses from local universities.